Roger is a person who leads this movement, who is the CEO and president of this organization, who is a friend to almost everyone in this room, who is as good a scientist as he is a risk taker, as good a leader as he is a collaborator. And we will find out today whether he is as good speaking without PowerPoint as he is <laughs> at speaking with PowerPoint, because he, like all the rest of us, were traumatized by Linda Darling Hammond a year ago, who got up and said, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> And so none of us have PowerPoint. I sure hope she doesn't have PowerPoint for her speech later on. Roger Weisberg. I wrote out every single word of this presentation. Um, all of you should go to edutopia.org because that was a wonderful wonderful video, but there are so many great SEL videos there as well, Cindy. So the work that the George Lucas Educational Foundation does is just fantastic and extraordinary. And uh, Jill, thank you for the exercise, the activity. Uh, Jill and I did a congressional briefing a couple months back about Playworks, which I consider SEL in, in recess, and you know how to get kids to work together and play together. And then there's my friend and collaborator, Tim Shriver, um, who I, I just want to say publicly how much I uh, appreciate and admire Tim and how he has encouraged me to, to take risks and to branch out in all kinds of ways. And I really have to build on something that Tim said. This is a room of we. So my entire presentation is focused on conveying to the best that I can in a short period of time how I think about this, how Castle thinks of this as a room of we. Castle convenings are magical. They encourage creative thinking. They promote positive feelings. They foster strong relationships and sometimes lifelong friendships. And when they are most magical, they inspire collaborative action and commitments to improve the education and lives of children. The theme of the forum is momentum. The theme of my talk today is connections. We cannot build momentum together unless we feel connected. And to feel connected, we need to understand each other's views and to feel our perspectives and values are understood. Let me begin with a tale of caution and optimism. Before Castle was established in 1994, the William T. Grant Foundation funded Maurice Elias and I to convene an interdisciplinary group of uh, three times a year uh, between the years 1986 and 1993. It was called the William T. Grant Consortium for the School-Based Promotion of Social Competence. Our group had representatives from many different disciplines who focused on diverse outcomes. We had leaders from psychology, from education, from sociology, from public health, from criminal justice. Some focused on preventing problems like violence, drug use, and risky sexual behavior. Others focused on positive outcomes like citizenship, healthy lifestyles, uh, how to get along well with others. Some focused on preschool and elementary school. Others focused on middle school and high school. And we worked together for seven years and developed, I think, innovative, groundbreaking work to how to have a preschool through 12th grade scope and sequence for social, and uh, so we called it at the time social competence, social and emotional learning. For the first two years, we had language problems. Sometimes we used the same words and we meant different things. Sometimes we used different words and we meant the same thing. Finally, when we looked more deeply at each other's intervention manuals and assessment tools, when we site visited each other to see our work in action, we found out that there were many more similarities than we thought. Social and emotional learning inhabits a world of kindred educational approaches, like academic mindsets, bullying prevention, character education, deeper learning, emotional intelligence, family life education, grit, habits of mind, health promotion, multiple intelligences, personalized learning, pro-social education, positive behavior supports, positive psychology, positive youth development, school climate, service learning, student-centered learning for the 20, uh, student-centered learning, 
21st century skills, whole child education. Many of these well-intentioned approaches are introduced because we're concerned that our children are not living up to their magnificent potential. According to the Center for Disease Control, when you put all the risk behaviors together, about one-third of American high school students are engaged in multiple high-risk behaviors that can seriously jeopardize their future to be productive. Another third engage in some high-risk behaviors. And the ones who are not engaging in high-risk behaviors are exposed to risky conditions, whether it be unsafe schools, whether it be health-damaging media. We're also concerned about data from other sources that say that more than 50% of 6th to 12th graders self-report lacking social and emotional competencies, like self-management to reach goals or empathy. That 50% of high school students feel disengaged from schools. That only 30% of secondary school students feel that their school provides a caring environment. So many of us devote our professional lives to trying to do something to address social and emotional dimensions of learning and development. But the approaches tend to be fragmented and reactive rather than planned, ongoing, and systemic. Catherine Bradshaw and I have had interesting conversations about the fact that some people are lumpers and some people are splitters. A lumper takes a gestalt view and assigns approaches broadly assuming differences are not as important as significant similarities. A splitter creates new categories to classify approaches that differ in key ways. The education world needs lumpers and splitters. However, I would argue that the most impactful benefits to children will come from successful lumping. In 1996, Tim Shriver and I wrote an Edwe commentary called No New Wars, in which we said, School personnel see the importance of programs to enhance students' social, emotional, physical, and competent, uh, cognitive competence, but they also regard them with skepticism and frustration since most have been introduced as a succession of disjointed fads. Fragmentation breeds breakdown, and the school emerges as a hodgepodge of social initiatives with little direction or effectiveness. In a few minutes, you'll hear similar perspectives from John Bridgeland with the uh, release of his groundbreaking report on teachers' attitudes about SEL. Teachers think SEL is important, and they need policy and leadership commitment. They need professional learning and support. They need time to do it well. I believe it is urgent to establish a framework on how well-intentioned competence enhancement approaches can fit together. That's why I'm facilitating a session later on this afternoon called Connecting Kindred Strategies for Social and Emotional and Academic Learning. I believe that many of these approaches have more similarities than differences. It will require hard work in getting deeper understandings of each other's theories, research, and practices, but the time is right to figure out how to coordinate many of these approaches. We can do it, and we must do it. In a few minutes, I will share seven castle connecting principles that highlights some commonalities in our work. However, before presenting castles connecting principles, let me tell you a quick story about the first castle convening that I ever went to in 1994. I came to my first castle convening in 1994 at the Fetzer Institute in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Tim Shriver, Mark Greenberg, and Maurice Elias encouraged me to come. I met other Castle founders like Eileen Rockefeller Growall and Linda Lantieri and Dan Goleman, who had become good friends for 20 years. Dan was writing emotional intelligence at the time. He made the case that EI was a different way of being smart. EI competencies could be taught. Schools should do it in evidence-based ways, and there should be an organization to set standards for the field and encourage quality implementation of beneficial programming for students. There were about 30 meeting participants from fields of education, mental health prevention, and youth development, and we all shouted, right on. We were on board to think about this integration. We decided to call the field social and emotional learning. Our organizing view was that schools should emphasize students' social, emotional, and cognitive development. We wanted to emphasize that social and emotional and academic competencies could be taught and learned. At one point, I propose that we call the field CASHEL, Character, Academic, Social, Health, and Emotional Literacy. And I was told, not for the first time, that I was too obsessive. 
So Castle's work has focused on integrating school-based approaches to promote children's social and emotional and cognitive competence. We highlight using evidence-based classroom, school-wide, and school-family community partnership strategies to enhance five core competencies, sets of competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. We know when children know themselves and they can manage themselves, when they feel empathy for others and have good relationships, and when they make responsible decisions about themselves and others, they have a foundation for success in school and life. Castle's views are aligned with some of the research that examines the role of non-cognitive factors in shaping school performance, like Camille Farrington's instructive report on teaching adolescents to become learners. But we agree with what Camille and her colleagues write in their report when they say, quote, we find non-cognitive to be an unfortunate word. It reinforces a false dichotomy between what comes to be perceived as weightier, more academic cognitive factors and what by comparison becomes perceived as separate, a separate category of fluffier non-cognitive or soft skills. They go on to write, in reality, these so-called cognitive and non-cognitive factors continually interact in essential ways to create learning, such that changes in cognition are unlikely to happen in the absence of the interaction. My colleague at the University of Illinois at Chicago, Jim Pellegrino, chaired a National Research Council Committee on Defining Deeper Learning in 21st Century Skills. They published a very important report called Education for Life and Work, Developing Transferable Knowledge and Skills in the 21st Century, which identifies three broad domains of competence, intrapersonal, interpersonal, and cognitive. There's great alignment between their perspectives and Castle's perspectives about core competencies. Intrapersonal is about self-awareness and self-management. Interpersonal involves social awareness and relationship skills. Cognitive involves responsible decision-making and critical thinking. When we work with educators, families, and policymakers, Castle focuses basically on two key questions. What do we want our children to be, to know, and to be able to do when they graduate from high school? And how can an entire community be organized to ensure that all students reach the stated goals? We want students to learn skills and dispositions to be academically proficient, and we also want them to master the social and emotional competencies to be good citizens who contribute positively to civic life and productive work. work. Social and emotional competence is critical for achieving these life outcomes, and schools should make it a priority to ensure that students acquire, apply, and master these competencies. For the rest of my presentation, I want to share information about seven connection principles that drive Castle's work and connect you with some people in the room who embody these principles. Forgive me if I don't mention everybody. I'm so appreciative you're all here. I wish I could spend a little time with it, you know, highlighting the incredible value of, of uh, all the work going on. But I, I hope people are proactive today conveying, if I don't mention you here, some of the wonderful work you're going to do. So I'm going to talk about these seven principles, and then I'm going to conclude with our charge for today, identifying action steps that we can take together during the next year to advance evidence-based programming and policies that foster quality education for students to become knowledgeable, responsible, caring, and contributing. Now for Castle's connecting principles that guide programming to educate students who are engaged learners and academic achievers, as well as successful family members, friends, citizens, and workers. Principle number one, social, emotional, and cognitive development are connected. Relationships provide a foundation for learning. Emotions affect how and what we learn. With funding from the Buena Vista Foundation and Betsy Abel, uh, Castle completed a review of preschool through high school student learning standards across all 50 states. It is noteworthy that all 50 states have preschool social and emotional development as well as academic learning standards. However, only a few states have K-12 student learning standards in social and emotional learning. Castle worked with Illinois as the first state to develop K-12 social and emotional learning standards. There's great interest in other states to develop both freestanding SEL standards and standards aligned with Common Core. 
One state, Kansas, recently established social and emotional and character development standards based on the research of Castle and the Character Education Partnership led by Mark Hyatt, who is here with us today. Connecting principle number two, research, practice, and policy should be connected. We know that people who are socially and emotionally skilled to perform better at school and in their careers. There's a lot of correlational data. There's a lot of longitudinal data, uh, as well as common sense that points out, that out. Now there's compelling evidence that we can promote student social and emotional competence and that both their behavior and their academic performance improves. CASEL was originally the collaborative to advance social and emotional learning. We convened 20 superintendents in 2001 who told us we needed to change our name to the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning if we wanted to change practice. Before we changed our name, Joe Zins, Margaret Wong, Herb Wahlberg, and I edited a trailblazing book, Building Academic Success on Social and Emotional Learning. What's the research say? Then Joe Durlach and colleagues did a meta-analysis, uh, which you've seen already in the GLEF video, but I, I'll just say we know the impact on, um, on academic performance and, and, and behavior. Two other things from that meta-analysis that I think are important to, uh, to, to point out is that when teachers implement these programs, the effects are stronger than when outsiders do. There's some benefits from outsiders, but when teachers do the work, there's more impacts <coughs> consistently. Also, when there are implementation problems, the effects aren't as strong. So our conclusions from this work is that SEL works across locations and grades and can be done by school staffs, but it needs support from policy leaders and professional learning experiences. There are other meta-analyses now, I won't get into it, but in Great Britain, a new team just did a meta-analysis on social and emotional learning. In the Netherlands, another team did a meta-analysis on social and emotional <coughs> learning. So the work is expanding, not just nationwide, but internationally. Principle number three, school-based SEL programming should be connected across the years with socio-culturally appropriate preschool to high school classroom instruction. Castle worked hard with collaborators like Ruth Cross, Lula Ford, Ann Neerad, Sam Redding, Darlene Rossitti, and Chris Cook, who you'll hear later on today, to develop the K-12 standards in social and emotional learning in Illinois. These standards are on the <coughs> Illinois State Board of Education webpage. They're based on three learning goals, 10 standards, uh, 50 developmentally based benchmark 600 performance descriptors of what students should know and be able to do. It is a serious piece of work. But CASEL completed that work in 2005, and it's being improved as CASEL works with eight collaborating districts who are also developing SEL standards, and we need updated models of SEL standards and related assessment tools. Uh, connecting principle four. School, classroom, and uh, culture, and climate connect to students' behavior and attitudes, and students' behavior and attitudes affect school, <coughs> climate, and culture. I learned as a graduate student that development is transactional, not unidirectional. Uh, any parent who has two kids knows the limitations of how parents influence kids. The kids also influence us. Positive learning environments provide opportunities for students to learn and further develop social and emotional competencies. And classrooms are filled with socially and emotionally skilled students. And when they are, they're more caring and safe. So people like Barbara Savone of What Kids Can Do or Erin Gruel from the Freedom Writers Foundation and Roberto Rivera and the students last night show how powerful young people can be as a positive source for improving society. Principle number four, effective instruction connects to students' social and emotional development through teaching methods that, one, ensure active student engagement, two, provide opportunities for students to contribute positively, and three, enhance authentic constructive communication among students and staff. Recent advances in SEL programming focuses on ways to connect SEL, pedagogy, and curriculum. Eric Schaps, Tom Roderick, Margot Strom, Susan Rivers, Sue Keister, Mark Greenberg, Maurice Elias, and Joan Duffel, among others, are leading evidence-based SEL program providers who have focused on linking SEL to various subject matters. Mary Gordon's Creative Roots of Empathy brings a baby into the classroom, and boy, does that foster authentic communication among the kids. 
Katie Arrington and Uri Treisman from the Dana Center have emphasized linking SEL with math instruction. Jesse Register and Linda DePriest from our Nashville CDI district are doing collaboration and doing trailblazing work linking SEL with project-based learning. Ellen Moyer and her colleagues at the New Ten Teacher Center are also engaged in exciting work preparing teachers in the first three years to link SEL and academic instruction. The afternoon session on embedding SEL into the common core of instruction that Larry Aber facilitates will develop this theme further. For many years, CASEL has uh, identified guides uh, on how SEL performance influences academic uh, performance. In our new guides that we're working on now, we're going to turn the picture in the other direction as well. We're going to look at evidence-based academic programs and see what the impact might be on kids' social and emotional development. It's time to go both ways thinking about the integration. Six, strong family community, uh, school, family, and community programming must be connected for the strongest uh, powerful impact on children's learning and development. Children grow and develop at home and in school and in the community. Combining environmental support and reinforcement from peers, family members, school personnel, health professionals, religious leaders, and media increase the likelihood that students will adopt healthier lifestyles. Multi-level interventions in which peers, parents, mentors, school staff, and community members create a culture, climate, and supports for positive behavior are needed to address the social and emotional needs of all students. Pam Cantor's work with Turnaround for Children, Dan Cardinelli's work with Community and School, Catherine Bradshaw's work with Positive Behavior Supports, Sam Redding's work in School Family Partnerships, these all represent innovative, multi-level strategies that promote the social, emotional, and academic learning of all students. Finally, federal, state, and district policies and supports must be connected and aligned to foster the implementation of evidence-based school-wide and classroom so programming to promote student social, emotional, and academic learning. This brings me to CASEL's primary focus right now, the SEL National Initiative and the Collaborating District Initiative. In 2011, CASEL and Novo Foundation launched a national SEL initiative to make student social and emotional development an integral part of every child's educational experience so that all children will develop social and emotional competencies they need to be career, uh, college, and community ready. CASEL board members, Jennifer Buffett and, Peter, and Pamela McVeigh-Lally of the Novo Foundation, Jennifer's also on our board, Linda Lantieri, Eric Schaps worked with Mike Perigo and his bridge band team on a business plan for this initiative over an eight-month period. One aspect of this effort is to work on federal policy. Uh, we are thrilled that Congressman Tim Ryan from Youngstown, Ohio, just introduced the Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning Act of 2013. His efforts build on Judy Biggert's uh, efforts when she introduced a previous version of the Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning Act. Representative Biggert will join a concurrent session today chaired by Joan Lombardi this afternoon on elevating SEL in national education policy. CASEL's most ambitious project in our 20-year history is the Collaborating District Initiative, uh, and you'll hear more about that in the next session, so for time, I will leave that to the next group. Uh, I, now, I just want to say just a couple of words about our task for today. After our morning learning sessions where we hear from John Bridgeland and his panel about the results of the National Teacher Survey, and after we hear from the superintendents about the Collaborating District Initiative, the collective charge for this group is to create an action agenda that emerges from forum presentations and conversations as well as your current work. We'll hear thoughts about action from Chris Cook and Linda Darling-Hammond. Then we move to four concurrent working groups that focus on the four topics in the agenda that we feel are critical to advance if we're going to improve children's social, emotional, and academic learning. The charge to each group is to come up with three specific actions that CASEL and our collaborators, we might take together in the ne first week uh, 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 in the next year. In the first week of June, CASEL will summarize the recommendations and action steps. We'll track them over the year and we'll report out on the action agenda next May, a year from now. I want to say just here are our CASEL commitments to the work. In the area of district and school capacity, we're going to continue our CDI implementation and evaluation efforts, and we're going to complete district and school guides and toolkits for systemic implementation. In terms of embedding SEL in instruction, 
CASEL will complete a major review of evidence-based preschool to high school SEL programs and evaluate how well they provide instruction and integrate with academic curriculum areas. In terms of national education policy, CASEL will work with Congress and we hope many of you in the room to support the Academic Social and Emotional Learning Act of 2013 and influence language of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act to include SEL for teacher and administrator professional development. In terms of coordinating kindred strategies, we'll develop model SEL-related student learning standards that integrate with Common Core standards. CASEL is committed to advancing SEL practice, research, and policy. However, as a collaborative, we want more. Working together, we believe that forum participants will create an even more sustainable action agenda. During the CASEL Forum, we aspire to identify a powerful set of synergistic strategies that will be implemented over the next year. Some might be done through your work and your organization. If so, let's make sure we communicate about it. Maybe there are other ways and others in the room, uh, others in the room can support these efforts and coordinate with your efforts. Of course, we're also interested in identifying new steps we can take together. So let's become fellow lumpers. Let's take advantage of our time together to determine the best, most impactful ways to establish nationwide preschool to high school programming that educates students to be socially, emotionally, and academically prepared for college, careers, and life in a challenging wor world. The time is right. Let's make connections. We have momentum. Thank you. Oh.